Kim St. Marie. It's a learning at the University of Toronto. It creates something called Kenya. There is no dioxin or furon released in the air, and it will produce energy and light for homes, and would bring revenue to the city of Toronto equivalent to about $200 million a year. I also launched my program, uh, in which is 15 points. You may have read some of it, but just some highlights that I haven't added is that um, we need to work cooperatively with the two other GTA municipalities. I also would advocate for four times a year pickup, this is also Rod Muir's platform, to pick up mattresses and other stuff furniture. Uh, someone once suggested a red in program, whatever we want to call it. We need to make it more convenient for people to put used clothing and furniture and other reusable things. And if we could partner with um, Goodwill, Salvation Army, etc., and find a way to have those picked up, that would go a long way to reducing what we spend. As Robert uh, mentioned earlier, I'm the founder of Ways of Urban Canada, and done nothing in the past, but for the past six years, to study this problem. And, and the key to success here is understanding the composition of waste. It really is amazingly simple. About 40% of waste is perfectly good recyclable items. About 40, well, another 40% is organic material. Another 15% is what I lovingly call the last six: electronics, furniture, mattresses, carpets, and textiles. Household items, household hazardous waste, and construction demolition debris. Surprising amount of uh, uh, that material that comes out of a home that we can renovate. And all three levels of government and individuals play a role here. In terms of the federal government, I certainly lobby hard for packaging. A lot of people talk about this at the, at the provincial or municipal level. Forget it. All you're going to get is product short. Our only hope for changes in packaging is at the federal level. I also seek money for uh, composting infrastructure. We're anxious to get the more infrastructure here in the city. I, I lobby the feds for e-waste program, a national e-waste program. And more importantly, I get them to tie this all to climate change. An amazing amount of energy we use just to make everything that we consume and then we throw it out. Uh, at the provincial level, a single serve uh, uh, deposit return, but you know, it wouldn't be for LCBO class. You, you've been really misled on this issue. I think we have a perfectly good system in place with the blue box, but we really should have focused on the single serve from a variety store where someone pitches it on the road or into a litter bin. Most people drink their liquor at home and have a blue box. What, what you've done is spend a lot of money dupli completely duplicating an already existing system. I'd also have the province working on advertising and promotion. This is a common problem with common solutions. Only a consultant wants you to believe that your waste stream is so unique that you need your own plan. They are paid by the job, that's what they want you to believe. But the reality is the waste stream is similar across this province, across this country. At, at our level, again, translucent bag is key, pay as you throw is key, a four stream of collection is key, and for residents, all I need you to do is separate. And that's what we need to be communicating to do. That this is a series of simple steps. You bought a can of pop separately, you bought a banana separately, you bought a TV separately. All we're asking you to do is at the point of discard is to keep them separate. And again, we can perform magic on this material. Thank you again. Um, but I provide leadership in the first year because if you look at the number of people here tonight for a very important debate, most people are saying it's out of mind or out of sight, it's out of mind. And um, this current administration has not helped that at all. And so we need to have a debate. We need to have people aware of the problems and aware of the solutions. And that comes through political leadership and a political debate. So everybody in Toronto should be aware that, first of all, I think it's shameful that we ship things to somebody else's backyard. And then we should talk about the solutions. Now, I'm no expert on it. But I'm told that incineration is working in many cities, in residential areas. There are no dioxins emitted. In fact, there is an incinerator being going through the process in the in Durham, York right now. And that may provide a short-term uh, solution to, uh, to Toronto. I think that uh, we need to, I'm not as, as optimistic about separation out of, uh, of the goods, the garbage, out of apartment buildings. And I think we need to uh, probably, instead of trying to retrofit all those buildings, 
we need to have a, a facility to separate, and then we need to find out what we're going to do with it. We need to, as you said, we need this 40, 40, 20, 40, 45, 15. We need to find the solutions that everybody can buy into. Now, it's not going to be unanimity. Not everybody's going to, you know, to hold hands and say, kumbaya on this thing. But there can be a consensus as to how we're going to deal with it in Toronto, whether it's consideration, whether it's gasification, which I'm told is extraordinarily expensive, whether it's anaerobic, there are some really good solutions to it, and we're going to have to make a choice on that after we have a public debate, and then deal with it. Just put it into the works, uh, in the appropriate uh, space. It may not be within the boundary of the city of Toronto, but certainly in the vicinity to the welcome host, where we do not try to have to drive 18 wheelers for uh, two and a half hours to get rid of the stuff. Thank you. Robert, just allow me 10 seconds. I just want to clarify. 10 seconds. Okay. This, this idea that, that, that all the people live in apartments is just incorrect. There are about 1,500 buildings in this city. They, they, they have about 20% of the population. And there are problems. The shoot's a problem. But the rest of them walk, live in multi-family townhouses and they walk their material to the curb just like single-family homeowners. We should not be allowing 20% of the population to dictate our success. You've got, you live in an apartment, you've got no leaks, no lawn, and no leaks. If it takes you five more minutes a week to responsibly manage your waste, so be it. Could I incinerate 40% of Toronto's waste? No way in hell. Uh, would I incinerate 20% of it? No. 10? Pretty unlikely. 5%? Perhaps. This is a milk bag. And short of taking a bucket to the store and carrying milk home in it, I don't know how much more environmentally friendly packaging can be. Now, the, the, the plastic industry continues to tell me that this is nothing more than frozen natural gas. And we're going to bring natural gas from Alberta to burn it to make power anyway. Why not get a bag out of it first? But the fact is that 40, 20 percent of the waste stream contains a lot of batteries, a lot of mercury containing thermometers, a lot of a laptop computers containing lead. These are the last materials you want to burn. Am I completely opposed to this? No. I, I am somewhat open-minded for a very small percentage, above five, but very importantly, a very great volume. Things like this don't compact very well in the landfill, and they take up a great deal of space. So it's, it's only 5% by weight, but by volume, I guess it's closer to 15. Thank you. Jane Pitfield with a question. Thank you. Well, we all know that there's an incinerator in Peel, and this continues to meet all of the provincial standards, but it is 15 years old. And why would we not always want to look for the best and brightest ideas? And I really feel, too, that it should be tested here in Toronto. We shouldn't just say because it works in some other part of the world. Uh, because that was part of the problem for apologizing. We never tested it in Toronto. It worked in Milwaukee. Milwaukee, we built it here and had a bit of a problem. Um, what I, again, am intrigued with is it's a form of gasification. It's uh, a clean energy from waste facility in Sault Ste. Marie. I believe that uh, the cost will come down, just like everything does when something's been around for a while. At the moment, apparently we're being quoted $150 a ton. The green bin costs $140 a ton. What we need to look at is the energy input for this, the cost, and also what's released to the air. And I feel that uh, it's very important to have a made in Toronto solution, not uh, a made in somewhere else solution. And I, we do know we need energy. And in terms of percentages, I've always felt if we could reach 65% with recycling and composting to the best of our ability, for the remaining 35% only, we would consider a clean energy from waste um, solution. And 
let's not forget that Halton has already offered to help us because they may be building a facility large enough. So if for some reason we can't site it in Toronto, this is why we need partnerships. And there are other municipalities that are calling Toronto, like Peterborough, I think though they've uh, recently partnered with York. But this is something we need to work with other municipalities on. And uh, rather than the fear mongering, I think it's important to have leadership through education and Toronto experience. Thank you. Stephen Woodrow. Well, I'm, I'm not uh, bound by ideology on the, on the solutions. And when I was uh, in a public meeting, a councillor from, um, from Durham came to me and said, you know, we offered to joint venture in, the, in an environmental assessment with Toronto a few years ago. Uh, Toronto turned us down on the basis of ideology. They said they wouldn't have anything to do with incineration. And uh, we're going along, but we're almost finished with the environmental assessment process. And I read some pretty detailed reports and uh, um, other facilities that are state of the art for consideration. There are no dioxins emitted into the air. Uh, there is energy from waste. That is what I understand is uh, being proposed in uh, some location in, uh, in York, Durham. And for a short term solution, it may be very well be quite dandy for the city of Toronto. I dare say if that, if that incinerator is located, and it's certainly a lot closer to Toronto than, uh, than London is. It's, it's, uh, it would be a 30 minute drive as opposed to a two and a half hour drive. And it's not dumping it into the ground. It is dealing with it in an environmentally safe manner. And uh, the only problem with it is, is that if it's really good, then you tend to put more, uh, more garbage into it. You feed it. And that is a problem because you have to still keep recycling. But uh, as a matter of principle, I have uh, I have no problem with it as long as it uh, as long as it is environmentally sound and as I said I've read uh, reports other cities there are no dioxins it's a it's a good solution it is not the absolute long term one though. Thank you. Um, it's come up so what would you do to change that change it? Well, I think again. Uh, with NIMBYism, it's uh, important to provide the right kind of leadership. And my idea of what's been missing in Toronto for the last three years is a strong local voice. And we have not been engaging with people the way they need to. And I'm going to begin a series of town hall meetings. I want to go to every community every two weeks. And I want to get back in touch. I don't personally think I've ever lost touch, but I think the City Hall has gotten out of touch. And I think that all of our councillors have to do a much better job of working with residents, rate here, tenants, associations, as well as CIA. So we really know what's on the mind of people. Every poll I've seen, though, has shown that about 75% in the amalgamated city, I'm not talking about down by the beaches of Portland, who had the bad experience with the old style of generation where there really were some health concerns. And I think that it's important whether the, whether this facility is located at a transfer station, whether it's up on the 407, whether it's um, uh, in another part of the city. I know George Manley, one of our counselors, is always offering to take the facility in his ward as he says that what he'll expect is you know, lots of money for his ward as well. So all of these things can be worked out. But I think Indianism is something that um, is good in the sense that you have a right if you have an investment in property to care about the character of your neighborhood and the environment of it. We just don't want it to get um, grow uh, we don't want fear mongering and lack of correct information. For example, David Miller was talking about poisonous gases in the air this week. This is not good leadership. There's no proof that there are going to be poisonous gases. It, all of the state-of-the-art facilities at least have scrubbers to clean what's being released. But what I'm advocating for is something that never creates the purons and dioxins, and that's what the Toronto Environmental Alliance, for example, has always been concerned about. So I think that NIMBYism is something that can be managed, but in a way by having the maximum number of people involved, and so that everyone is step by step 
um, participating, and in that way, people don't feel that they have to stand up and fight against it because they've been involved from the beginning. Every, uh, every city, every town, every every homeowner uh, has uh, has thoughts of divvyism. I mean, uh, it happens with social housing. It happens with uh, you know many uh, you know much travel thoroughfares. It happens with, uh, with dumps, it happens with uh, you know, any other facility. Um, one of the things we have to recognize though in Toronto is that we are landlocked. You know, we, are, uh, we aren't growing anymore, we, aren't, uh, we are growing, sorry, but I mean we have, to, we have to grow within. And so we don't have the wide open spaces, and that's probably good, because the way Toronto's been run recently, if, that, if we didn't have that, we'd be having a dump there. So you have to, you have to honor Nidhiism in the sense that you have, as James said, you know, people own property, but they live in a, in a neighborhood. You don't want that uh, neighborhood spoiled. Um, and it has to be, you have to respect it, and yet you have to work with it. And it's actually quite good because it puts your feet to the fire. Not the homeowner's feet to the fire, it puts the politician's feet to the fire. To say, you have to come up with a solution that has buy-in, that is technologically acceptable, and that you can deal with the community on it. So I think it's, uh, I think it's in a very selfish way, I, and if it's to the nth degree, yes, it's a bit of a poison in our, in our civilization, in our, uh, in our, in our uh, you know, body politic. But it also serves a very good purpose, as I said, it keeps politicians' feet to the fire, and that's a good thing. Thank you, Rod Mirror, please. Frank, I don't know what the answer is, but, but I know what I would do. And that's stop counselors who actually fuel this kind of thing. This is a brochure of Councillor Paula Fletcher from her last campaign. And she circulated around her neighborhood, the fear of a smokestack in her neighborhood. And on the reverse side, she talks about 80% diversion. Well, Paula has sat on works committee these past three years, and I've missed very few meetings these past six years. And I can tell you without a doubt that Paula Fletcher, together with Adam Giambroni, together with Glenn the Bear Maker, have done more to impede our progress forward here than to move us forward. And I would not allow this to happen, to foster this kind of nimbyism. Again, the solution, I don't know. But I certainly wouldn't let councillors go around the city throwing gasoline on this fire. And thank you so much. <laughs> well, that's well, the answer. I mean, how much that, if you want to be, to be explained, I mean, I think the federal government over the years has taken a, a lead role in environmental uh, issues. In fact, uh, it was the uh, it was the last group, no, it was it the second last Trudeau administration that created the Ministry of the Environment. And it's, it's hard to believe that 30 years ago there wasn't a Ministry of the Environment. And when you talk to people about it, then you talk about the pollution, and Lake Ontario was, was full of phosphates. It just seems like ancient history now. You know, when we look back, we think how bad it was. And we had to know that the vehicle emissions were, uh, were also a matter brought in by the federal government. So the federal government has done, over the years, both liberal and conservative administrations, I might add, has done uh, a terrific job in, uh, in our environment. I'm not that impressed with the last one, last uh, missive of uh, Ms. Ambrose two, uh, two weeks ago when she was talking about 2050. Um, my asthma is going to be a lot worse by 2050. If I have to wait that long for clean air. But um, it has taken a leadership role. Is it doing enough? My first answer is no. It can, uh, it can do more. Um, not only in taking a leadership role in public education and setting regulations and setting standards and setting goals, but also it should um, be more of, a, more of a prod to municipalities. I think it's shameful that we have large municipalities in, uh, in Canada that dump raw sewage into the ocean. You know, St. John's, Newfoundland, Halifax, Montreal, uh, Victoria. Un obscene amounts of, of uh, raw sewage just going out into the ocean. Uh, it's, it's astonishing to me, and uh, the federal government does have the control, the control under the Fisheries Act to deal with that, 
and they simply don't. Uh, why? It's a lack of political will. So I'll go back to my original answer. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm it up. Well, my name is Donovan Rizzo. I'm a two-time Canadian heavyweight champion. I've, 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 um, um, I've been in Toronto all my life, you know, 11 years old, and I've seen all the garbage on the street every day. And you're, I'm just um, sitting and talking about, you know, an extra four bags, they're going to charge extra for the protection for bags, and the four bags. If I have an idea of cutting all the garbage in half, would you be interested in cutting all the garbage that going to the curb in half instead of taking out four garbage bags and taking out two? Would that be great? Uh, are you asking, do we think your attacking plan is a good idea? Yeah, because, because the fact is that everyone throws garbage every day, but the bags are very empty. And that's what the government sees all the time. But if every also a compact environment, instead of putting four bags on, they put out two bags. That would make a big difference, don't you think? Well, what I think is, is that 130 minutes colleagues in Ontario have to get a I'm just giving my answer. 130 municipalities have a bag tag or a limit for pay-issue growth. And Toronto has resisted moving forward with this. And the fear mongering was it's going to cause illegal dumping. It's actually going to work in the reverse. If you come home and a bag is still there and you have to hang on to it for two weeks, that's when someone's going to feel like dumping it. And I think whatever way we can compact the residual waste is a good idea. I also think that if people ensure that they don't put things in that shouldn't be there, like recycling or used clothing, etc., or many of the other things that we've been talking about, uh, people will find that on average right now, every two weeks, most homes can actually, um, actually are only yielding about 2.3. That's the average across the city right now with single family homes. But um, I know that initially when people read and they're told that they might only be able to have four bags every two weeks, it depends. For those who are very environmentally conscious, they know that's easily achievable. For others, that sounds like a big sacrifice. But I think that the only way we're going to encourage people to put less out is to cause them to stop and think about how much they're doing. And I think I'm embarrassed when our city doesn't have the guts or the ability to just step up to the plate like everyone else is and say, it's our turn. And by the way, Michigan was watching because they knew what our plan was, I'm sorry, and they could see how we were sliding back, sliding back. So I answered, I said, I think your idea is an intriguing one and it would probably help reduce. Thank you. Thank you. About the studies that show that incineration is, or, or as you like to call it, is a good potential solution for part of our, our garbage stream project. Um, I don't know what, what studies or what research you've been looking at, but I do know that basic high school chemistry will tell you that the materials that are rich in energy, in, in energy that are going to take a lot of energy to incinerate them are, are organic, are, are kitchen scraps, and are plastic because they're very high in hydrocarbons. Now, these are the exact same things that can be or recycling. So I'm just curious to hear your perspective on how you expect incineration to be a viable strategy when at the same time we're trying to use compost, we're trying to recycle, which are essentially more, more sustainable. Forgive me for saying this, but I hear the bias in the question because I have to correct a few things. I don't support incineration. Let's define incineration. It's oxygen and burning. The thin gas that I refer to is the same way that the University of Toronto is actually advocating doesn't involve oxygen. And the dioxins and purons are never created. So um, the other thing I'd like to say is this, the first goal is to recycle and compost to the maximum. We also know we're always going to need probably 15% for landfill. So what does that leave, about 20%? I am told that these technologies do not have to include plastic because that raises concerns for some people. And plastics can be dealt with in other ways. And I would never put organics in because then we'd be going back on our commitments for composting.
go home tonight and light a small fire and throw, dinner, <laughs> and throw dinner on it. I got news for you. It's going to go out. Organics are 80% water and take more energy to dry and burn than they give off. This is not something you're going to want to burn. But to my earlier point, the milk bed, what, and the point I didn't make before is, is that my wife, Rita, who's in the audience, you, you know, you reuse these a couple of times. You put bread in it the first time. You put something else in it the second time. But you know, there comes a time when you put that boneless chicken you bought from the store in it. And when you take it out, it is covered in blood and guts. And I'll tell you, Rita, at that point in time, says, that's it, my friend. <laughs> and at that point in time, this becomes valuable energy, I believe.